I cannot imagine Columbia without the farmer's market now. There'd be protests, <laughs> as it's taught an awful lot of people about food. Never lived in a place that had such a big farmer's market before, and I think it's such a draw for Columbia so that people know that, you know, we care about sustainability, we care about local produce and healthy eating and activities. I love the relationship. Everybody's so consistent, so kind. They remember your names. There's so many that I know, and I can go get honey or eggs uh, with somebody who I've bought it from for years. Uh, but then a lot of times I meet somebody new who has a new product that I haven't tried. It feels like a celebration every Saturday morning, like the coolest place in town. It just reminds me of my home, my home country. It truly is the heart of this community. Just the energy that you find at the market, the variety and how things change from season to season. It not only keeps our local farmers busy and in business, but it also helps me to eat locally, eat in season, and to make sure that I'm getting the freshest possible produce inside of my little one's bellies. Uh, a little ritual I do is I'll walk into the market and there is a high spot. And so I will um, kind of go there, close my eyes for a minute and then open it and I see this amazing sea of humanity. It is an interchange of commerce that, you know, you could just trace this DNA back eons of how we, how we exchange goods for services and this really pure form of, of commerce. So there's joy in communing with people and there's joy in health. So to provide food that keeps us all healthy as a community, physically and mentally, that is the definition of joy. Spaces where we can interact with our neighbors and our community are becoming rarer and rarer. And we're, we're, we have created a space um, where it's just growing and growing. It's becoming a larger and larger community every Saturday. It's good for our economy, right? It's a place that creates community, but everybody eats. And so to have this place that, you know, local farmers and local producers can bring items that we can all purchase and eat and fill our bellies is just an awesome thing for our community. As more money is invested in those farms, it helps them sustain their livelihood. And then that helps grow the whole industry. And, and so the market plays a key uh, role in that process to connect farmers to these customers, but also the spin-off effects of that. It's important to support local farmers, and that's, that's really what my job is, is to make sure that our farmers are successful. But to do that, we have to, we have to add all these other things um, and, and making sure that we have this enjoyable space where our community can come together and um, where it's not just like transactional, like, like a grocery store, you know, where it's, um, where it's interactive and where there's all kinds of different things happening, whether it be live music or the kids' activities, or it's just your favorite farmer and you want to talk to him and like see how things are going on the farm. I'm going to be honest, most of the time it just feels normal. Uh, you, know, you show up and you're just, you're there and you do the job and, but, but every once in a while there's somebody who like wasn't there before or didn't know what the old times were like. And they're maybe, maybe like complaining about something. It's like, you don't know what it was like. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't have a, a, you know, an 80 foot greenhouse and we didn't have like a forklift and a tractor and like all of these great facilities to do all this work. And, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't have flush toilets, like, uh, just like really simple things. Uh, and so there's, there's moments when I realize like, whoa, this is huge. I think it's really important to like first say how many people over the last 41 years got us to where we are. To do something like that, you have to be a bit of, of a visionary. You have to have a picture in your mind of what it is that you're hoping to create and develop. People ask me like, how, how do you do it? How do you guys do it? Like, we want to do it. It's like, well, you need all of the right people in place and we're, it, it took us 20, 30 years to find all the right people to make it happen. Um, 
and, and having all these amazing organizations that were already successful, um, that were already well established and had really strong leaders uh, to be able to, to pull it off. The market actually started officially back in 1980. At that time, um, it was really a push by the community at large, Chamber of Commerce, and I think the Kiwanis. 1974, 75, uh, along about then, I was a rural chaplain for the United Methodist Rural Fellowship. I, I and we had been studying, observing farmers markets in Hawaii and California and Atlanta, Georgia and other places. With all of that in mind, I stumbled onto the Cambodians here in town who were living in the new Catholic church, the one in the north edge of town. And alongside the building, they had a typical Cambodian. They started a garden, a rather sizable garden. And here they had all this uh, food they were growing and they gave a lot of it away, but they needed a market for it. Well, that clicked with me, what I'd seen about farmer's markets around the world and across the United States. So I decided we needed a farmer's market here in Columbia. We're big enough for it. We had the Cambodians um, produce and there were others around and they encouraged some of the growers way back then in 1980 they were selling on uh, filling station lots just themselves you know there were like a number of those around town so i went to the chamber of commerce and um, suggested that to them and they appointed one of their persons to work with me i went to the local county extension agent and the three of us then uh, determined that the uh, old fairgrounds would be a good place to start. So it started then just like it runs now. Promoted on um, the newspaper and uh, radio or television, and people come. I remember the, the first day, uh, of course the first day of anything is exciting. The scene was very simple down on the old fairgrounds, I think 12 or 15 uh, marketers including the Cambodian refugees, and they simply backed their pickups up. We had two rows, short rows, with the rear end of the pickups towards each other and people in the middle, and it was a, a happy, positive time. I went to college up here, and it pretty much hung around and did my other profession. And that was probably about, in, that was probably 1984, okay? And so I started to go to the farmer's market as a customer. Because it was on the fairgrounds, there were a lot of buildings on the fairground for that once a year when there was a big fair, okay? Some were structures that were totally enclosed. And this particular one that we were under was, like I said, an open-sided, like, pole barn. Known as the Kiwanis Building. It held 24 spaces at that time. Those spaces are a little bit smaller than what we see now. They were eight foot wide and it was basically full. People were stelling outside. I've been looking at, at old photos and there's, I guess they used to rope that, that pavilion off to where people couldn't get in until they rang the bell. So you would see in these photos, people like peering in, like what's on the tables today? I became a vendor in 1985, uh, once I completed my college years and I had um, decided not to pursue a degree in horticulture, but got my degree in education, which allowed my summers off to give me time to um, grow strawberries is what was my first crop. About in 1989, I got a little burnt out of my regular job uh, as a physical therapist running around the country. And I said, I need to take a year off. And so that's what I began to do. I began to cut back on my professional life as a therapist three days a week. And then I started to farm the other time. Mm, gosh, the first major shakeup would have been the sale of the fairgrounds uh, to the, the family that ultimately donated the park. Uh, you know, Ron Shai, the family, you know, traded that property for Cottonwood. So basically the fair moved to where uh, the, the current fair's at. Some of those buildings were 
you know, dilapidated. They needed to be renovated or torn down. When Clary Shy Park was given to the city, um, one of the first amenities that we talked about was the need for a recreation center. And so as we looked at location uh, and we looked at how individuals can access that via car, bicycle, or walking, um, that is why we gravitated back towards that park um, for our indoor recreation center. And so with the master plan we were working with, we knew where the arc would go, where the old fair arena was gonna be. And so those 20 acres, they took down all the buildings. And so we had to, we had to move and we moved to a parking lot, Parkade. I would say it, it hurt virtually all the vendors in some way or another. Pop-up tents weren't really quite as common then, so it was just everybody in the hot parking lot and our customer base really plummeted with that. And so everyone scrambled buying Walmart umbrellas table umbrellas, you know, pick, or constructing something themselves out of a uh, metal conduit with made, weld some joints together with a tarp over, over top. And it, it really, I had to make a decision at that time, um, and I quit being a vendor shortly after it moved to Parkade. And it just really struck me, I said, this is not going to work, we, we've got to do something. We knew, those of us who had been farmers marketers, knew that the market was suffering every rainy day and it would just be horrendous. It would, you would go from making, uh, you know, several weeks worth of living on a couple of nice days to making just nothing uh, every time it was soggy. So um, in Kansas City, there was this uh, group that organized themselves and they called themselves a food circle and I, uh, I studied them from like 94 through about 96 um, for my doctoral dissertation and it was really interesting work. You know I came here to get a master's degree and leave and I was interested in international development. I wasn't gonna stick around and then I'm like oh well we need to change some things here in the United States before we talk about international development. So I started coming to the market maybe in the mid 90s and we wanted to see if we could develop a Columbia food circle. And so um, a bunch of us came together, Dan Kevler and myself and Denny Phillips. The Columbia Area Food Circle attracted a number of different people who were interested in agriculture from different points of view. Some of us wanted to uh, get labels on food in grocery stores, for example, and some of us wanted to help the farmer's market. I, I had this vision that we, would, we needed a structure permanent home and uh, that it can be combined with other things like with Parks and Rec. And so what we did at that time, we realized we had to begin to connect more strongly with the city. So Judith and I and uh, some other folks, we made coffee here like I think every Saturday in 98, 99, 2000. Oh my God. So we would go pick up coffee at Lakota and bring it out here and set up a volunteer booth and just gave out information. And now that's the Oasis, right? And it really um, blossomed into that. We wanted to get the community involved and we wanted the community to see that, that we had something of real value to offer, not only just to people coming buying food, but their kids, you know? And then like, we also had days where we had a pie auction. We start doing pie auctions once a summer. And we did a corn festival where we roasted corn on a big grill. I kind of started that and I had some friends help me every year. It was a real tradition. As the people in the food circle sort of took off on different tacks, we, we kind of splintered a bit and sustainable farms and communities came into being. And that organization was to strictly put focus and attention on the building project. You know, we were, we were thinking about how could we make the pavilion a place for everybody to come to and to be part of it. Like, the, it wasn't just the, the market and the pavilion, but making it a, really a food destination. So, we were thinking about kitchens, we were thinking about, you know, covered space, but we were also thinking about, um, you know, let's get uh, kids here uh, 
let's have a space for people not to have to go to McDonald's for their playrooms, right? Um, things like that. So we were, you know, we were driven really big. And so within the sustainable farms and communities, we would start to have children's events uh, with our volunteers and our organization. So we could really engage children in some of the activities, very similar to like what CCUA does right now. And then like within a year or two, we were back on the property due to Rex Campbell, who was a city council person at that time, and he was a big advocate of ours. He was a rural sociologist at the University of Missouri, but he was on the city council. That was a real important part of the next move, you might say, to kind of just build, build our reputation and, and really just build the organization. Dan had now become the president, and uh, he hired me to do marketing for the market and we did radio and made up a jingle. I think only the radio station probably has a recording. Okay, I'll just do it, okay? Knowing that I'm, my face is probably really red, goes, um, Columbia Farmers Market, it's where we love to shop. We know our farmers by their names and all about their crops. It's fun at Farmer's Market. Come join us and you'll see. Columbia Farmer's Market, it's the place to be. <laughs> yes, it played on the radio. The Columbia Farmer's Market, where smart shoppers meet every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. for the freshest locally grown produce. The farmer's market's famous for vine ripened tomatoes, sweet corn, peppers, and potatoes, beautiful flowers, plants, and ornamentals, plus handmade soaps, natural crafts, and sweet honey. Be first in line when the whistle blows Saturday morning at 9 for delicious baked goods. The Columbia Farmer's Market every Saturday at the Old Boone County Fairgrounds corner of Plink Scales and Ash, Columbia. Welcome back to Pepper and Friends. You know, the Columbia Farmer's Market has been a part of our community since about 1980, and it's in full swing and operation right now, but they've, they've changed location. I want to tell you about that. We have Dan Kibler with us from the Farmer's Market. Good to have you Hi, here. Nice so you're here. no longer out at the Parkade Plaza. No, we, we moved one week ago. We moved now. We are over at... Um, the old fairgrounds, and I really want to emphasize old on this. It's yeah, the old not the fairgrounds. new fairgrounds, where the, where the Boone County Fair used to be. Is that on Clink Scales? Clink Scales and Ash. Okay. Uh, the 20 acre plot right there, we are in the north corner of that. Okay. How many, how many vendors do you have that come to the farmer's market? About this time of the year, we probably have between 20 and 30. Once we really get full swing in the middle of like July, we'll have up to 40 vendors, yeah. 40 to 60 even sometimes. And everything is locally grown. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that, that's the great thing about it. Uh, this is direct marketing. So everyone that is there is at the farmer that has grown their produce and mm -hmm. they're selling it right so there. So let's remind you once again, it's a new location. Don't go out to the Parkade Plaza for the farmer's market because right. you'll tomorrow, you're at the old fairground, yes. all right? And that's uh, on Kling scale. Monday and Wednesday, 4 to 6 p.m. Saturday. This, this was, this was the plan. If we're gonna have anything over there again, we've gotta be on that property. Because once you're on property, it's hard to kick you off. <laughs> it's like, because the community begins to kind of go, yeah, this is where the farmer's market happens every week. And we love it. I made a presentation to the city council on a pre-meeting, they do a pre-meeting before they're open to the public. And I, we presented a, a slideshow and talked about all the benefits uh, for the community, for the farmers, economic development, and everything else, and showed examples from other places. And that was a way to sort of like get the city council aware of how important we were to this community. And we got, like we got USDA and NRCS folks to help us put together that, uh, that slideshow, you know. So it was kind of a team effort there. We began to gather uh, community members. Were we out at um, Dan's farm, I think maybe, and uh, had this strategic planning session. I said, well, we want this place to be the Saturday morning place to be, right? And Tim Harlan, who was part of a group that, and he's like, that's great, that's what we want, you know? So we were really trying to think about it as a public space. So we, we were aware that things like this were happening. Uh, Dan and I actually both went to a um, Seattle for a conference on developing public spaces. So it was, you know, we, we were learning as we went along. 
how to make this really a, a better part of the community. One of the things that was going on at that time was the ARC was being prepared to be built, and so there was a fundraising going on for them, even though it was, it was the city, but there were people who were really um, community members who really, really wanted a recreation center um, that was city sponsored. So there was a lot of campaigning for that and they agreed that if we would support them then they would support us and they did. But they wanted details and so those details included getting an architectural drawing. At that time, uh, part of my university responsibility was I was a state uh, environmental design extension specialist as part of my faculty duties. I just called that department over there. I said, would you be willing to help us? And he said, sure. And I was just like, see, I was, see back then I didn't trust myself. It was kind of like, how, afraid to ask. <laughs> afraid to ask for help, you know? And he stepped forward and he just gave of his heart and soul. And the ARC was gonna go up then for, for public approval and uh, they had a consultant. And so I said, maybe you just need a consultant uh, so that you can say you have a consultant to make it seem a little bit more legitimate. Uh, and then they got me. So, uh, so I charged them a dollar, so they had a paid consultant. Uh, and that was the beginning of a, of a long relationship. Uh, and it's where I met Denny. There was significant tension, I, should, I think, is the best way to describe it between farmers in the farmers markets. So, you know, there is a history in the local food movement, it's really interesting because there's kind of this history of people who were farming market gardens and this has just their, been their job. They were like, they'd been doing it for many years or their family had been doing it and they thought they should produce good stuff, but you know, market at a reasonable price. And then there was this whole other set of folks that were thinking about being organic and doing it for ecological reasons, right? And then you started to have these foodies coming into it. So we had those, those farmers represented in the Columbia Farmers Market. And they'd been doing pretty well, but this whole push to have a pavilion, that really exposed the tensions between the vision that the different sets of farmers had. So, you know, you have the farmers like, well, we don't need anything very big. We just want, you know, we want a pole barn that we can sit under so it doesn't rain on us, right? You know, people like Dan and others had this vision of what I was just describing. Oh, let's have a playground and a, a, a kitchen, you know, all of these kinds of things. Every other place in the country also had the same problem, okay? Like, it was difficult for them to move, to, to kind of move the vision. We're at the Boone County Commission Chambers and it was, um, it was pretty tense and hostile and Tim Harlan, myself and Martha were at the back. It was not, it was not a pleasant meeting. So the vote was to continue kind of the plans for the Columbia Farmers Market and that passed by one. And the people who lost then decided to make their own organization. You know, the, the market did split. And I actually don't think it was such a bad idea because I also think Columbia was getting big enough. Um, you know, people needed to have their visions of what the markets should look like. But it also gave a lot of energy to the farmers who stayed with the Columbia Farmers Market to implement their visions. We're not like the other businesses. We're here forever. Like, it's not gonna stop for 100 plus years. We can make this work if we do it right, and, and we're gonna help our community. We, but we had to prove that. We had to little by little get people's confidence, both at the city level, the county level, parks and recreation level, the schools, the citizens. We need to come back with a surefire plan on how to, to come up with a farmer's market to help develop the rest of that property. And from that point forward, then Ron helped us to create a plan to do charrettes to involve the entire community. And I think that was really, really important. A lot of architects just uh, go, oh yeah, I'll draw you something up. But when, the, when you do a charrette, 
you invite different groups in and you get information and feedback and you design it off of what a, the community wants and needs. I don't delude myself as a designer to think that, that we have the only best solution. You don't need to know about it. The people are the experts. You just need to be able to listen and be able to put that into a vehicle that can be translated into a building. When we wound up using Daryl Rantis as the architect, it was like it was like bringing family in. It was, he was so congruent with the way we thought about things. <laughs> Not a coincidence. He was a former student of mine, but still, <laughs> it sunk in apparently. So uh, when he graduated from architecture, he went to work for Faye Jones in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Faye Jones was an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright. So the, the sort of DNA of that particular kind of uh, artistic expression he had in spades. And so I called him and said, would you be involved in working with this participatory process called a design charrette? And he got real excited and said, oh yeah, I'd love to do that, even just as an excuse to work together. The beauty of that is, is I didn't have much say because it's not my deal. My, I was, my job was to make sure everybody had a say, everybody was heard, and everybody understood what was going on and their role in that and how this process would lead to the outcome. I think it felt um, expansive and the people came, I think people came to the meeting, not only the people who came every week doggedly to the farmer's market, but people who also were just interested in, um, they, we knew about farmer's markets as destinations for tourism and, and people to, you know, you come into town, you go to the Saturday farmer's market after you've gone out and had a good time on Friday night. You know, and that's kind of what our intent was. We wanted to create that, that little destination site. So whenever all these sports teams come into town to play games, you know, we want to say, hey, if you got time off on a Saturday morning, you know, take your kids over and see this market. The Ark was this beautiful, modern building. So the city council at that time um, wanted the farmer's market building to sort of match that architectural language. That was part of the reason that we got this particular architect to work with us because he is amazing. I should say was amazing. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. But he, um, he created this beautiful wave roof line and, and uh, so it was a very gorgeous building. The beauty of, of Daryl's work, and I mean that literally, the beauty of it, it comes from an uh, incredible aesthetic. Uh, it was not a pole bar. And so part of the dilemma in architecture is if you have a vision, it's real easy to sort of outvision the general public. And the general public stands back and goes, like, what are you thinking? We didn't get that. We got everybody just loved the building. Uh, and the next step was gonna be to fundraise. We're always kind of spinning our wheels a little bit because this is the problem with fundraising. You try to do it as a volunteer and you don't understand it. Here we are like, you know, academics. We didn't know how to like, like really accomplish that. Like, like how do you raise millions of dollars? You know, we were making some mistakes, like going out and saying we want to build this pavilion but not having large gifts in hand. So, you know, we, we had to find some expertise to help us think about fundraising. I can't remember exactly who asked me first. Maybe I volunteered something with the utilities and things like that. I had some experience in being able to kind of estimate that. So uh, I helped put that together and when people went out and looking at how much we had to raise and people talked about you know how much it's cost to operate it. I think that was mainly involved in what vendors wanted to know about what it would cost for a booth for the year. Dan Keebler and Eric Staley approached me when I was with Hubert Builders and asked for cost estimates on a new farmers market and remember that at that time the farmers market concept was really new. So we did cost estimates and I know that they went and tried to fundraise. But in the end, none of that mattered because the city did grant us three and a half years to raise the money to begin construction. 
and there was an economic downturn. We thought we were ready to do it. We raised a couple hundred thousand dollars in some ways, and then recession hit. And I tell you what, nobody's given any money during the recession. And so it just blew the legs out from underneath us. The economy was struggling, budgets, our own budgets were being cut, you know, due to the recession. And so there was not a lot of ability to move forward, but we did know that that site should be the home of the farmer's market. So we pretty much wrote that in an ink and said, all right, we're gonna keep the farmer's market here. It, the far farmer's market really laid fallow for a lot of years. Sustainable Farms and Communities became a very quiet organization. Um, I left, Dan, kind of kept it going, but there, it, there wasn't much going on for three or four years. And then, and then the next generation came forward. I, I kept a lot of friends from that era and was still a regular market shopper. And uh, Dan Kibler specifically said, we need you back. Um, would you be, would you help us? Would you, could you be a leader sort of thing? And I served for uh, eight years. Um, First year was a member at large, second was uh, vice president, and then president for the remaining six years. And then CCUA came along, and they were just like this amazing organization. Two of the co-founders and I graduated in 2008 undergrad, and at the time there was like no jobs, and so we're like, well, let's start something. And something that the three of us had in common is that we were all kids of teachers, and we all grew up with a vegetable garden, and that was very formative. And we all had older siblings, too. And so we had this great education from that kind of perfect storm and wanted to give back into the community somehow and by putting in a big garden right on the corner of uh, St. Joseph Street in East Ash, global recession was going on and there was food crises going on around the world. And it just seemed like a really pragmatic way to teach people how to grow their own food. It seems like something that's never going to go out of style and extremely helpful way to give to the community. I was working uh, for Heifer International down in Arkansas and uh, Carrie, who's now my wife, uh, we met there and she was from Columbia. And so after uh, we finished up our summer down there, we came back to Columbia. CCUA was just getting started. There was a group of folks who were doing some cool uh, composting and gardening demonstrations and teaching and uh, that's what we had just come from at the Heifer Ranch in Arkansas and so uh, we jumped right in. During that time uh, all of us working on this project sort of had a different skill set. My job was to make sure that um, the farmers and growers and vendors understood what we were attempting and that if anyone were to approach them they would give the same wholehearted testimonial that this deserved. After about a year or two we moved up 2010 to the urban farm on uh, Smith and Fay trying to figure out how do we make this a job? How do we take this to be more sustainable in terms of financially and for our lives to, from a all, sifting from an all volunteer to higher impact and be able to hire more people and grow that. Uh, that first year in 2010, we had our harvest hoot nanny out there. It was the first time we had our hoot nanny. We wanted to show off this site that we had been working on all year, and that's now an annual event. Really, the urban farm was this great kind of, you know, huge canvas for us to work on and. Uh, built all kinds of chicken coops out there and taught all kinds of classes. I served as a convener more than anything else to get people together and I spent my 30-year career working with cooperative extension folks out across the state in community development, civic leadership, so I was pretty knowledgeable of rural conditions when I joined the SF&C board. The board was kind of feeling stuck. They didn't know which way to turn and they were disappointed. It was a small board. I also walked into the board uh, at a time when they were putting together this Access to Healthy Food program, which was designed to teach people about nutrition and health, 
Uh, from there, I began to tackle the problem of, well, where are we going with this? The vision is still there, the need was still there. Little by little, I think we stepped up the caliber of, of uh, managers that we had. And I think what happened also is like, as the market became just more successful and more vibrant and more known to the community, we had better applicants come. I started managing the Columbia Farmers Market in 2013. And back then, uh, we had a, a much different setup <laughs> than what we have now. Um, so we're still at the same location, um, which is behind the arc. But back then, it was this very um, dusty chip and seal parking lot. Um, a lot, and it was chipping, a lot of chips. <laughs> Um, a lot of like tripping hazards. Like after the market, my legs would just be coated in this like layer of dust and filth. <laughs> um, we had, you know, porta potties, um, sheds that we stored all of our market equipment in. Something that was special um, and typical, I guess, of a farmer's market with a, like pop up tents where everything, you know, just kind of built up into this, this beautiful market. And then at the end of the day, we're back to this um, empty parking lot. Um, but it's, it's not, it wasn't sustainable and it wasn't a great environment for our customers and our vendors whenever we had bad weather or, you know, whenever it was really hot and lettuce just like melted on a table. CCUA was outgrowing our site at Smith and Fay Street uh, which at one point was bigger than we ever needed and now wasn't nearly enough room. And so we, we got together with Parks and Rec. Columbia Parks has like 3,100 acres across the city, 96 different sites. And so we did inventory of a bunch of those for underutilized property that would be suitable for urban ag. Mike Griggs, who's the director at the time, was said, hey, would CCO want to farm one of these? And we said, you have this city park which is essentially sitting unused. Uh, the half of Clary Shy Park that, that is not the Ark uh, was really just grass. There were no restrooms, there's no shade, there's no benches. Uh, there wasn't even a sign that says, this is Clary Shy Park. Where the farmer's market has been selling since 1980, and it's like, well, Maybe, let's talk about that. Let's get the farmer's market involved. Let's get sustainable farms and communities. Let's, let's put our heads together to kind of vision how we can do this as best as possible. And so as we talked about this park and we talked about how we can combine fitness, wellness, and healthy lifestyles, it makes a lot of sense to say on the other side of the parking lots and the 10 acres that we have, we would look at an agriculture park. We all agreed to work together because we all had something that the other needed and we could all offer something that made it each of our projects stronger. I remember those first brainstorming sessions we had. Um, I remember there was like a whole group of us and we met at Harold's Donuts and came up with a name of called, called ourselves Friends of the Farm. Um, but the whole brainstorming session was like, what do we call ourselves? Like, who are we? I mean, we're all these independent organizations, the Columbia Farmers Market, Columbia Center for Urban Agriculture, Sustainable Farms and Communities, and then Parks and Rec. And uh, so we came up with the name Friends of the Farm to kind of become this collective of nonprofits uh, that would fundraise and design and build the, the ag park. Um, we know we had a, a very, very good tenant um, at the park in the Columbia's Farmer's Market. We just knew that for them to grow and to um, start to get bigger and offer more programs and more things associated with the Farmer's Market, they needed a permanent facility. So as we had these discussions that led up to the 2015 park sales tax, a lot of the discussions focused on a permanent structure uh, for the Columbia Farmer's Market how we can also have space for the Columbia Center for Urban Agriculture, and then how we tie the three entities together into producing uh, what is an event for individuals to come to the Columbia Farmers Market. I wanted to create programs that, um, that taught children about where their food comes from and that they're not just wanting to buy honey ice cream when they come to the market. I love the honey ice cream, right? But like, 
I want them to get excited about eating fresh fruits and vegetables. And so um, back in 2014 and 15, um, and that's really when we started like reaching out to CCUA because they helped us establish a lot of that stuff, uh, was we created a, a Good Food Detectives Club, um, which is this activity booklet that kids get. And for each activity they complete, they get rewarded with munch money that they get to shop with at the farmer's market on fresh fruits and vegetables. We we'll maybe bring in some compost and the, the kids can look through it and they get the magnifying glasses out and try to find some worms or some bugs or, or maybe some fungus or something that's in there. And we can talk about how uh, that creates uh, nutrition for the plants. Uh, we'll maybe identify parts of the plant or try to match uh, different fruits and vegetables with their seeds and um, but it just kept growing into, okay, so what's next? Like, what do we do next? Like, okay, let's start offering cooking demonstrations. Let's teach adults how to eat healthy food, how to cook good food. And I like to call it a big onion because there's, there's a lot of layers. The, the farmer's market's this dynamic thing with lots of people. CCOA has a lot of programs and a lot of, it, it touches a lot of lives. And together that just adds capacity for the food system and around our, our health system that's preventative and proactive health care. And then if we can build a facility that we can do demonstrations, you know, we start thinking about all the ways that could work. And then next to a healthy workout facility. There's just these layers that just kept getting added and the, the, the idea, the grand idea just kept growing and growing into, okay, we're not just building a pavilion, we're like, we're developing this center, the center for agriculture. At the time I was a board member for CCUA and it just seemed that I could provide them with an idea of what might go on this site. Uh, so SOA Architecture provided the initial master plan. And a master plan basically is getting all these disparate ideas on paper so that you can see graphically where things go. I remember having lunch with Adam and Robbie Price at Sycamore downtown, and Adam and Robbie talking about the new farmer's market, what it was gonna be, the pavilion. So I'm super excited that I'm finally, after 20 some years, part of the farmer's market construction. Because when it came time to meet with the architects, we, we knew what we wanted. We wanted a nice big pavilion, simple, that the people could back their trucks up to, provide shade and protection from the rain. And we felt that it needed to, to connote a farm. And so you think about farms, you think about barns and outbuildings. We wanted it to have that look. And so metal, metal roofs, more barn-like structure. Uh, we also wanted it to be not only for the market, but for the public at large. Um, so it became a question of being simple enough to work, yet affordable. When you, when you have a project of this size, the, the hardest thing is <clears throat> sort of finding a fit of a building, coming up with that cost, and then getting over the sticker shock <laughs> of what that is, and then going about to say, where would this money come from? You know, to me, I think the significant factor that really got us rolling was in our 2015 park sales tax. You know, we put in, uh, we put a line item in a project that said, Clary Shy improvements, and we put in $400,000. So our challenge to Adam, Karina, all the farmers market, Center for Urban Ag, our challenge with them was to match that. If they could raise 400,000, then we would use that match to put toward a facility of a farmer's market. And then Friends of the Farm started to make connections with um, the MFA group, with MU Healthcare, and other organizations, and that kind of snowballed into private donations from individuals to other organizations and associations coming to us and asking us how they can help. So MU Healthcare was one of the major lead donors at the very beginning. Um, and they could see the, the synergy between the hospital and the healthcare with the food of the market and the education of CCUA and the arc there that shares our campus. Um, it honestly exceeded my expectations in terms of how quickly we were able to achieve that goal. 
I would have originally told you that 10 to 15 years down down the road, we would still be talking about adding facilities and, and kind of trying to discover new funding sources, but it really started to come together very quickly. And I give that credit to the Columbia Farmers Market staff and the CCUA staff for being able to get that word out and speaking to people. Um, it truly was a campaign that was driven by word of mouth. People really leaned into it and said, this is good for Columbia. This is investment in our health and our farm capacity and our education capacity. And so to, to the credit of the community, they really leaned in. If you look at the donor wall now, there's like 700 plus names there. Some people gave a lot of money and wrote a big check because they, they wanted to see it happen. So my hat goes off to them. Makes my job easy as, as a fundraiser when folks really lean into it and are generous and invite their friends to also participate. It was probably one of the fastest groundbreaking ceremonies in the history of groundbreaking ceremonies. Gosh, it might have been in the in the fall and it was just the worst weather ever. It was cold, it was pouring down rain. I had people uh, texting all, all, all day, are you still having it, you know? And so we're working with the farmer's market, everybody, you still want to do this? They go, yeah, we got to, we got people coming in from out of town. and. So everybody huddled up and they went out there and they did it. And, you know, uh, our contractor did a great job, got the slab in. And then fast forward to 2019 and we actually did it. You know, uh, the our grand opening was, I think it was July 6, uh, 2019. And we had over 8,000 people that came through the market that day. And I, it was it was absolutely insane. Um, I'm gonna get emotional talking about it. You know, like we we work so hard and so long and there's so many vendors that that have been putting so much time and energy and the community um, since the 90s. I came into to the market knowing about the, really the failures that, that we had had trying to build this roof and saw all these blueprints and there's like these tote bags. It's like, imagine the farmer's market pavilion that I still see customers shop with um, and and then it actually happened and that that day was just so surreal and and really every Saturday since like I still I get there before anybody else you know six o'clock and it's it's quiet and peaceful and the birds are chirping and I just take a couple seconds and, and look around and just am still amazed by what we have. One of the faculty members I work with was at the grand opening and she came up to me and whispered in my ears, it only took 25 years, but it's a lot of hard work that gets you here. And people were willing to do that. And I got to be a part of that, it was pretty sweet. It wouldn't have happened with any one of those four friends of the farm by themselves. It happened because they all came together and decided this was important for the, for the public to have. And that's the difference, that collective effort paid off in what really is a premier facility and it's it's bared out because they were voted top market in the country just after the end of the pandemic so presently the ag park um, has the farmers market it has the the urban farm and we just finished fundraising for the two wings to the building so that every vendor now can be under roof Somewhere along the line, it came to their attention that a shared use kitchen might be uh, a part of this building scenario and an event space might become a part of this building scenario. CCUA got a grant and paid us for a year's worth of work to do research and design a shared use kitchen. So after years of being heavily involved, then more recently we got to stick our toes back in. It'll have an event center that will allow about 175 people to gather. So weddings, family reunions, uh, seminars, um, dance groups can use this. Uh, it'll be a place that can be rented out for the public to use. We'll have a commercial kitchen, which is really the key to the success of this ag park. It'll allow us to have cooking classes for the public, to be able to understand the vegetables that we grow in our farm, how they can cook them at home. It'll allow the vendors of the farmer's market to be able to use for possibly production, but also for food demonstrations. We'll also have offices for the farmer's market and for CCUA. 
And lastly, we're going to have a library. But this is a lending library that'll be stocked with hoes and rakes and tillers and things that public can check out for their own guards at home. Something that just like makes me smile every time I think about it is, is the community support that we have received. And it, I mean, from the donors, to the vendors, to the community organizations, like all of these people have come together to make this happen. Like, it's not just us, it's not just CCOA, it's not just Parks and Rec, it's, it's 30 years of our community working together trying to make this happen. And, um, and it happened. As I tell my students, I'm like, you know, they kind of get down like about how hard change is. And I'm like, well, let me just tell you, 25 years ago, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to sound like the person who had to walk uphill both ways to school, right? But I think it's really important for folks to understand that there are trajectories. I mean, that, the Colum that there were farmers here that were forward thinking enough in the early 80s to establish a farmer's market. It's pretty amazing, right? and that there are these waves of movements that, that kind of carry people forward and um, they ebb and flow, but it happens, change happens. And that's what I tell my students, like there was no Columbia Center for Urban Agriculture, there wasn't this big pavilion, you know, um, but there were people that were really embracing um, you know, ecological, socially minded food systems. You know, a lot of times I get to see what a physical structure does for a business or a community, and uh, this farmer's market pavilion is really just changed the narrative and the shape of all kinds of issues regarding, you know, food and our, uh, the economy of food, and I just think that I'm proud that we've been able to provide the physical structure to allow for that. You know, a lot of times people say, well, what's the unintended consequences? Well, in this case, they were very good because now we end up with this great facility that's going to be one of the largest indoor shelters in Missouri. In a lot of ways, I like to think of what we do as a billboard. So if if you see it, it becomes a possibility. If you, you know, you see something your neighbor does in their lawn, you're like, oh, I could do that. Thousands of people drive by and they can see this big garden in the environment and normalize urban agriculture. There's so many entry points. Somebody may come there for a field trip or just because it's around the corner from their house or they may come to the farmer's market or maybe they're going to the ark. When they see the farm, there's, there's kind of that magic. You remember your field trips when you were a kid, right? And those are impactful. And so when we're giving a tour and like, we're eating spinach and a kid says, I want more spinach. It's like, you can have more spinach. Well, everybody can have more spinach. That, that, can re that can ingrain this positive part of their brain of like, this tastes good. We, this is what we do, this is kind of normalizes that access to food and that's the magic of it. So we want to do more and more of that to help make that kind of the obvious choice and, um, and to influence folks to want to grow, grow a garden at home, to, to pick vegetables when they're in the salad bar at school or wherever. Um, you know, I, I love meeting folks in the community who said, my kid came home and said they wanted to start a garden. And I'm like, where did this come from? And they did a field trip. And so we've got some folks who donate to us because their kid was kind of the spearhead behind a home garden. And I know we're, we're so lucky. I, I travel when I get a Saturday off. Uh, I always visit farmers markets. And most markets across the country are still your, your pop-up tents. And we've become this, this model um, for markets to, to replicate across the country. And we're just getting started. Like, I, I can't wait to see where we're at in five years and in 10 years. Um, you know, we, we still have buildings to construct and um, I, I can't wait to see those. But all of the programming and stuff, um, you know, we, we have these ideas of, of what we want to do, like in the, the new event space when that's finished. Um, but I think I mean, we'll have to get settled in there and really see what, what we can do, but I imagine that there's so much more that we're not even thinking about that, that we can do and that that park's gonna offer Columbia and Mid-Missouri. You know, I feel so good for our community to have invested in that and to help make sure that that came to fruition. And so uh, I'm just proud of being a, a Columbian that, that was involved a little bit of that. When a project's over, I always feel that it's a part of me and it's always a part of the people that work on a job. There's a pride 
when they drive by in the future years and say, we were a part of that. You know, sometimes we, we, we don't believe in ourselves and um, we don't think that the vision we have could actually happen. And uh, I guess I needed to experience that, you know, for myself, for my own growth. So it's kind of like, I got, I was fortunate enough to get to see over this many years, my vision way at the beginning become a reality. And so it's like for other people, I say, do not give up on your vision. You know, you peck away at it. You can make this happen. It just won't happen like this, but it can happen. And it will happen if you're just excited about it and it's really coming from a place inside of you that is really, you know, authentically you, it'll happen. You know, um, there's a lot we didn't get. <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean it was totally wasted effort either. And I think that's something we always have to be cognizant of, that it was bigger than so many of us. And so many people have come in and propelled it forward. The, the joy that you see in people's faces when they come to this, this uh, ag park and they understand just how, how much is here, how nuanced it is, how important it is to their daily lives, the community that it creates, that's, that's just pure joy for me. I'm gonna cry. I can't believe you you made me do this. Um, it, it's it's the wonder that you see in someone's eyes when they say, "Oh my goodness, this this is incredible. How did you all pull this off?" And you know, there's a very easy answer for it. It was it, everybody did this. You know, it was it was really the will of the public that brought this about. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of who we are wound up being in the process. And it was something I really believed in, and the people that I worked with believed in it too. Uh, and how could you not want to be a part of that no matter what? Anything that's attached to the soil, to the land, brings out the normally the best in people, and plants do that. To add the farmer's market to one list, no major involvement, but I helped start it. Uh, I view that with pride and gratitude that I was having. I was given the opportunity. The greatest thing we can give or receive is an opportunity. An opportunity. <laughs>